Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. So as we like to say in you know in a hacker context, Emacs is often seen as an operating system, right? So this talk is going to be about an operating system or a distro which tries to be like Emacs. So that's that's kind of it's the other way around. So what does it mean actually to be like Emacs? What's what's the nice thing about Emacs? Well, Emacs means Emacs may makes all computing simple, right? <laughs> Not everyone agrees. Some people have found other other meanings to the acronym, but yeah, I tend to prefer the first one. So, what does it mean concretely? If we take back those four freedoms of free software, how does the design of Emacs relate to those four freedoms? So, of course, we have we have licenses to guarantee those four freedoms, and the GNU GPL typically makes sure you cannot remove those freedoms, which is a nice thing. So that's the legal part of free software. Uh, but now, what does Emacs do to, to help with that? Well, what we can do from a technical viewpoint is to make the first freedom more practical, okay? So the idea for Emacs is basically you take freedom number one and you map it to a concrete system design. So that's what we're trying to do with the Gix package manager. So actually, if we look at early writings by Richard Stallman about the, the design of Emacs, he was saying basically that with a programmable editor, people would end up programming without really noticing. And so this helps improve computer literacy. That's, that's kind of a fashionable word these days, but this is a writing from 1981, right? And the idea was that you know, secretaries perhaps at the time would use Emacs. And so these are typically people who were told by society that they would be unable to program. But with a programmable editor, the hope was that, you know, with Emacs, those people would finally end up being able to program by themselves. So they would really be in control of the software they use, right? And yeah, that's the hope. Of course, nowadays, if you look at what people are using, like if you look at what secretaries are using, they're using probably free software, sometimes proprietary software. But even free software like LibreOffice is not something which will help you gain the ability to program. It's free software from a legal standpoint, but it's not software that will free its users in a way that they can you know, manage to extend it and to hack it and learn how to program. So I think we have the same sort of situation with distributions. So, yeah. So of course, I mean, if you look at, so Emacs predates the GNU project. But if you look at the GNU project and the four freedoms and all that, it's really the same spirit. It's, it's trying to help emancipate computer users. Trying to put people in control and allow them to, to actually control the software. And again, that's what we're trying to do with the GNU Geeks project. So concretely, what, what are the, bar the barriers to distribution hacking? Well, if we, if we consider Emacs, what it allows you to do is to easily study how it works and to easily extend it. And that's something that's not really possible with many distributions and package managers nowadays. So, so of course, the first thing we would like to do technically is to allow packaging to be more, you know, not an expert thing. We would like users to be able to do packaging. And we would like users to be able to extend the distribution. So just as an example, uh, I happen to work in a research institute which with many people doing high performance computing. So they have a shared cluster and some people, you know, well, each research team wants to have their own piece of software. So they want to have, let's say some, you know, scientific software compiled with a very specific MPI version. And another team will want to also have the same 
software package, but compiled with a different MPI implementation so that they can compare and you know that kind of stuff. And on top of that, each user within each team wants to be able to choose when they are great. So a very common problem on, on clusters is, you know, you have sysadmins taking care of install packages, um, researchers doing, you know, doing their stuff, experiments and benchmarks, and suddenly sysadmins decide to upgrade all the packages, and so your experiments no longer work as you expected them to because you just suddenly change all the underlying software. So that's a very common problem. Um, yeah, in addition, people on clusters typically use um, environment modules to handle that, which, which amounts to basically making a new distributions by hand on the machine. So I think this poll should be able to help more on this kind of topics. And this is related to what Tucker was explaining before. This post should be able to help people in these use cases. Package management tools and sets are also kind of arcane. It's, it's really hard to get in and to hack them, to modify how they work very often. And yeah, of course, when you install an operating system, you have all sorts of esoteric configuration files, formats, everything, which makes it, again, a bit harder for someone to come in and say, look, I'm going to change how things are configured. And lastly, if you look at a typical GNU Linux system, or Unix system in general, we have all sorts of programming language barriers. I mean, if you look at a typical system, you have a whole set of bash scripts to, for instance, initialize the system, or you have a big C daemon which takes care of system initialization and stuff. Um, you also have you know, all sorts of Perl, Python scripts all around. All this makes it quite hard to, to hack the system to understand what's going on. Because each time you, you want to look at something, you know, if there's a language barrier, you're probably, at least that's what happened to me in the past, probably you're going to say, okay, I, I just stop here, stop at this level, and uh, I see later for, for the next language. Right. So I think all these are typical barriers for distribution hacking. And this is where GNU Geeks comes in, right? Uh, yeah, so like, you know, it's like Emacs, it's not a solved problem yet, but I think we, we are able to solve a bunch of problems, notably some that Luca, Lucas mentioned just before. So I guess it's time to, it's time for a demo because all this hacking stuff is cool, but at the same time, we wanna be able to actually do something with the package manager, right? So, okay, so we, we basically, with Gix, we provide a single command, which is called Gix, with a number of subcommands, nothing very unusual. So, let's say I want to install a package. So, obviously, the first thing I would want to do is to install Guide. So, Guide is a Steam interpreter, compiler. Um, so, I just type Gix package slash I guy. And I don't need to be root to actually do that. And yeah, it's telling me, okay, guide is installed now. Or it's complaining because I don't have network access, which is fine because I already have a, a local copy of the binary. Um, if I do which guy, well, I can see it's around here. It's actually in a .gix profile directory in my home directory. So this is fine. Now, Let's say I want to install a different version of Guy. And yeah, Python. So what we are doing here is that we're doing a, a single transaction. And in a single transaction, we're installing two packages. So I if you went to, to the talk by Nicholas Geron this morning, you'll probably recognize a few bits about yeah, you know, mix and mix OS. And you may be able to spot the differences as well because uh, the whole set of packaging tools is different. Okay, so what do we have now? Well, we have actually downgraded, it's saying upgraded, okay, we found a bug. Uh, we've downgraded Guile and we've installed Python at the same time. 
And the tool is telling us you should be careful about search path. So I don't know about you, but I think search path are one of the most difficult problems in computer science. Uh, I mean, we always end up having problems just because we forgot to set the environment full bar path correctly. And so here the tool is helping us, it's telling be careful, you don't have a Python path variable, so probably it's not going to work as expected. So you can just, you know, explore that variable. Um, and yes, now I have the old guide version installed. Um, what else can I do? Yeah, let's say I want to install guide JSON, which is a JSON interface for guide. Okay, again, it's telling me I have yet another environment variable that I should define for things to work correctly. Well, so far, so good. So, um, let's say I'm unhappy with my, you know, current configuration. I can always roll back, right? And now, if I list the installed packages. Obviously, uh, I'm back to the situation where I have just guide 1.8 and Python. Okay. Um, okay, but of course, if we want to be the Emacs of distros, we need an Emacs flow to begin with. So, fortunately, a fabulous geek hacker called Alex Cost came up with an Emacs mode which allows you to do all that from within Emacs. So, let, let me just show you. So first, I can list all the packages which are installed in my profile. So this is my my real profile. The other one was for the demo, right? So I have a whole bunch of packages installed. Um, let's say I want to install a new one. Uh, yeah, I can list the latest versions of the available packages in the distro. And what should what should I install? Yeah, let's say I want to install NVI. So I can just click, type enter on it, and I have, you know, the description and stuff about NVI. Uh, and if I go to the install button, then it just gets installed pretty much like what you get with the git package command, except it's in Emacs. Yes, now it's installed. And I also, I also have direct access to the source code, so I can, like if I hit show, yeah, I can directly see the source code of VI, which is nice from a free software perspective because you, you know, you directly, you have a direct connection to the source. Uh, Luca was mentioning that Debian is providing meals, and actually Gix is providing meals and recipes in the sense that you have both a recipe for the package and you can get the binary as well. So the recipe itself is just here, so if I, if I hit enter, I see the recipe in the distribution, which is you know, this expression, I, I get back to that later. And so I can directly hack it if I want to change it. Yeah. So another thing I can do with this Emacs node is to list the generations of my profile. So a generation is just each time you make a transaction, like you install packages, you remove packages, you just create a new generation. And from within Emacs, I can select two generations like this, and I can ask for a diff between the generations. So what it's telling me here is that, well, the difference between the two last generations is that I have a new package that appeared, I mean, it's a diff, right? Um, yeah, and this is it, so I can, I can do that sort of thing for any generation. So this is, this is quite useful, because if you find out that something broke in, in your set of installed packages, you can always check what happened, right? And see what the different things are. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. So what's the workflow like? So basically you have uh, Gix developers, typically, or Gix users, writing those package definitions. And when they are done, I mean they test the 
to definition locally. So you can always write a package definition. You can git build name of your package and you make sure it actually works. And then if you have commit access, you just push it to the Geeks repository. And finally, users, they can just pull recipes from, from upstream, from Geeks. And from there, they can install the new package. That's a very straightforward workflow. And in addition, we also have a build farm, which is, um, which is basically doing continuous integration of the distribution. So from there, you can fetch binaries if you want to. And I mean, the tool will automatically use binaries if they're available. And if, if they're not available, it will build things locally. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a different workflow from Debian, for instance. Um, Luca mentioned before one of the dirtiest secrets of Debian, right? Which is that actually Debian maintainers, Debian developers, upload software which they build on their own machine. And so, you know, what, what kind of trust can you have in that? I'm just paraphrasing what he said. <laughs> um, so here we have, we have that build farm making, making builds. But since every user also has recipes locally, you know, every user is able to build software by, by themselves. And so you can, if you don't trust this build farm, you just don't use it, right? Uh, yeah, you just don't use it. You can configure gigs to not use it and you're fine. Well, you end up building a lot of software locally, which is not always convenient. Uh, but you can also run your own separate build farm and then you can check if, if you actually get the same result uh, compared to the official build farm, right? So yeah, there's no, no maintainer uploads, no single point of trust, which is pretty nice. Um, so reproducible builds is, is a hot topic these days, uh, thanks to our friends at the NSA, PCHQ and stuff. Uh, we realize that it's important to be able to have more guarantees on the binaries that we're using. So in Gix, it is similar to what happens with Snix. When you build software, you get one of these long file names with a hash. And the hash actually denotes a hash of all the dependencies used to build the software. So for instance, when you build Guile, you need a compiler, you need a C library lots of other libraries. And this hash that we see here is a hash of all the dependencies. So you can query the references. And what happens is normally, if you take any two users building guy from the same Geeks recipes, well, they get nearly binary identical binaries, right? So I say nearly because um, there are always sources of non-determinism in, in package build systems and, and stuff like that. So fortunately, the reproducible uh, reproducible.debian.net project is working on it. And it's mostly uh, across these two issues, actually. Often, oftentimes, the problem is upstream in, in build systems and stuff. And so what, what reproducible.debian.net is doing is beneficial for all the free software community which is really, really nice. And I think there's a talk about reproducible.debian.net at 4 p.m., if I remember correctly today. So. Yeah, and so, yeah, as I said, with the NSA and other spy agencies doing all this kind of crazy stuff, it's really important to be able to, to improve what we have here in the free software community in a broad sense. Okay, so I said we were supposed to, to talk about hacking, so let me show a little bit how a user can hack Geeks. So what do we have? Okay, let's, let's take for instance the, um, the, the definition, the recipe for the Emacs package. So it, it looks like this. It's actually scheme code, but you don't really need to be a scheme hacker to understand what's going on here, right? It's, it's purely declarative. So we're saying, you know, we're giving the name version, we're giving the URL of the source code, a bunch of metadata, the kind of build system which is being used, um, 
yeah, here we are fixing a bunch of stuff in, in the post files. And then we're describing dependencies, blah, 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 you know, the, the usual thing. Um, and yeah, this is from Emacs. And since this is scheme code, regular scheme code for Guile, we can actually use Gazer. So Gazer is an Emacs mode, uh, which allows Emacs to port to, to Guile, right? So what we have here is we have Emacs and we have the Guile process and they are talking together. And so when I, when I put the cursor on, on a variable name, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it in, in the bottom line, but Emacs knows, knows what this is, right? It's a variable defined in, in such module, blah, blah, blah. And so we can use method dot to just jump to the definition of the, of the, of the library. Let me search for this one. Yeah, so if I can jump to the definition of libxml2, for instance. Um, yeah, likewise, I mean, and so forth. So that makes it very easy to, to navigate through the distribution. You know, you just type method dot like, like when you're using tags and stuff. And yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's say I wanna customize Emacs because I'm not satisfied with the default package. So what can I do? Well, uh, I can define another object, which is this one, for instance, Emacs no explosive. So again, it's a regular scheme object that we're defining, a regular scheme variable. And here we're just saying, uh, okay, I take the inputs of the original Emacs, but I remove GTK plus, right? So what I get at that is, I have an Emacs package, but without GTK plus as a, as a dependency. So I get an Emacs package which can be used on X11, but without GTK plus. Um, yeah, with this inherit keyword, which means I'm just copying the original Emacs recipe, and I'm just modifying a couple of things. And of course, in, in pure list spirit, I can go to a repo. Uh, so uh, basically a read eval print loop. And from there I can say, I want to import the Emacs module, okay. And if I tap Emacs, well, it's, it's, a, it's a normal variable. So I'm just, you know, giving a representation of that variable's value. Um, is Emacs a package? Yes, it is. Uh, what I can, you know, query the values of, of all its fields. Like I can get its connectors and stuff. And so we have a complete API to, to manipulate packages. So it's actually quite useful. So let me show you something. Yeah, so we have another fabulous hacker David Thompson, who developed Geeksweb, so it's it's a prototype currently, but uh, it's a web interface which allows you to you know to to view packages and to install them in your profile and stuff like that. So let's see if it's still working. Yeah. Um, so let's assume yeah. So you can search for packages and. So the browser here is just talking to, to Guile's built-in web server. So we have a Guile program which runs Guile's web server and that Guile program also uses Geeks as a library because Geeks, the package management tool itself, plus the distribution, all this is just a big library, okay? So, so we have that web server which is just using all this and browsing the list of packages and stuff. So yeah. We do a bunch of stuff, enter. Yeah. yeah. So you can click on install and yeah, it's, it's instantaneous because I guess it was already on disk. And if we look at the console, right, there's even nothing to see. I mean, it just installed Emacs in my, uh, just install Guile in my profile. Yeah, I can see here it's been installed, right? Anyway. 
And so, you know, this web interface is, is it's really cool because it's, uh, it's a small piece of software, but it's, it's made possible because everything is a library and because all the dispo, all the packages can be manipulated so easily. Yes, so that, that's the thing. Um, what else? Okay, so we've seen a bit of, of, of what's hackable with this. So, so far we were pretty much on the tool side. So here we have the tool side, which means, you know, the git package commands and all the libraries which allow you to, to traverse the list of package definitions. But then there's also the, the build side. So what happens when you build a package with, with Gix is actually the Gix program, so Gix package for instance, just talk to the build daemon. So the build daemon, if you were at, at Nicholas talk this morning, it's, it's the same as the mix daemon. So it's, it's a C++ daemon basically, which takes care of setting up ch uh, containers roughly, with you know separate namespaces, separate values and everything. So when you're actually building software on your machine, you're just talking to that daemon and the daemon itself creates those containers, right? And inside those containers, we also use Guile, so the Scheme implementation, to write, you know, all these scripts to actually build packages. Um, so that's 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 really cool. Let me give you an example. So again, if I go back to the repo, um, so I can say enter store monad, which means I'm going to do stuff which modify this GNU store directory. And I can say, let's compile this Emacs package definition. So let's turn it into a derivation. The derivation is a low level representation of the package reduction. And uh, I'm getting those, again, those weird file names. It, it doesn't seem so real because there are ellipses to hide the, the hash, uh, which we can turn off. Yeah, normally it looks like this, but again, there's an Emacs mode to just just hide those long hashes. Yeah, and I can say, okay, let's let's build it. Let's build this derivation. And okay, it's it's already on disk, so it's instantaneous because it's in cache basically. And if I go to that directory, well, I I have. Emacs files in there. So, so this is the pretty much high level view of what we can do with packages, but we can also operate with scheme expressions at a lower level. So we can send very basic scheme expressions to the daemon and ask it to build it. So for instance, I can do I can send it a, a GE expression, which is an expression representing build actions. Um, I can say true, and I enter the, the actual build expression. I don't know what else. Hello. Uh, make the output directory, right. And again, I get one of these derivations so I can also copy paste that file name and pass it to one of the command line tools. So if I do gix build of that grv thing, yep, then it's just, yeah, we see that hello thing. And it just builds a thing, so it builds an empty directory basically, which is, okay, not very useful. Uh, but you get the idea, we, we're using scheme in, in different places, which means we're able to reuse code and we have libraries also to handle all the build action and stuff required to, to build packages. Okay, so so far I was talking about packages themselves, but uh, again, we can go a bit further and we actually have a similar approach to, to operating system configuration. So what does it look like? So, 
Well, again, the thing is, if you want to install an operating system or if you want to modify its configuration, you just write a declaration of what you want your operating system to look like. So you, you give you know a bunch of usual details like the host name, time zone, uh, bootloader, configuration, file systems, that sort of thing, user account, services, and globally visible packages. And guess what? It's again Steam code. So uh, if we go look, if we try to inspect all these names of these variable names, we see you know it's just a regular Steam variable. So again, if I want to see what's in base file systems, this is the basic set of file systems which are going to be mounted. I can just jump to the definition. Um, I see, yeah, it's okay, we have three file systems which are mounted by default. That's fine. Uh, here we have services. So services are things which are going to run, you know, when you start the system. Uh, we have the Slim service. So, you know, Slim is one of these old login manager for X11. It's not really fashionable. I guess we'll probably have GDM or something like that later, but so far that's what we have. Um, so yeah, again, I can jump to the definition and I can look at how it's actually written. So Slim service is just a regular Steam function which takes a number of parameters and yeah, there's a lot of documentation. And basically it returns a service. Yeah, unsurprisingly. And the service just gives an expression which says how we want to start the service. And later on it gives an expression which says how we want to stop the service. So what, what action must be taken when, when the service is stopped? Uh, we see this hash tool thing which means it's an expression that is going to run at runtime when we actually start or stop the service. Yeah, we have a bunch of other services. So what we can do with this um, declaration, well, we have, a, we have a tool which you know takes a, an operating system declaration as an input and can do a number of things. Like, so it's a git system command. If you run git system build, and that file was called uh, So I can run the git system build command and pass it this file which contains this declaration I just showed. And if everything goes well, yeah. It's building a number of things like it's currently building the initial one disk, I think. And here we are. So we, we end up with a, a game with directory. Um, and if I jump into the directory, well, I basically have all the closure of what's needed for this operating system. So similar to what Nicholas showed this morning, we have a single directory containing everything, all the configuration of the operating system. So we have a both script, you know, the history directory, the initial one disk, uh, the kernel, and a number of other things. Uh, so far so good. So I can also ask it to build a virtual machine. So yeah, with that quick system DM command. It's a bit slow. I don't know if it's trying to get to the network. No. populating the virtual machine image. And here we are, we get uh, a script that we can run to actually start the virtual machine which we, which contains the operating system we configured. So what happens when we run it? Well, it boots, wonderful. It creates a number of user accounts at the beginning because it's a fresh um, 
this teammate, so he doesn't have any user returns at the beginning. And uh, yeah, if I jump to, if I can jump to the TTY, and uh, I don't know if you can read it, it's, it's a bit, yeah, difficult. Well, we get TTY and we, we can log in and we, we well, we have everything we wanted to have, right? And I can also go to the to the login screen. So this is a sli Slim login manager, and I can log in. And yeah, I'm getting a window maker session. <coughs> Again, not something very fancy, but we also have access to e nowadays. I haven't tried this yet, but. And this is it. So we can, from there we can actually run the, we can query the init system. What happened? I just go back to my, to my own machine. So we're, we're using a, a quite original init system, which is GNU DMD. So I guess most of you haven't heard about it. It's, it's a very, it's not new actually, it's quite old, but we just revived it for, for the purposes of this. So um, to talk to the init system, to the ID1, we use the gto command, and I'm doing it on my on my laptop here. And, and so if I, oh, why is it not? Yeah, if I run as root gto status dmd, then I can, I can list all the services which are started or stopped uh, on my system. So, well, we see many services listed here. So we have, uh, for instance, this service just takes care of uh, enabling crypt setup for my home directory. Then we have services which set up the, the font on TTY1 to TTY6. Uh, we have services for each file system to be mounted at the startup time. And we have services for normal daemons like the git daemon itself, and I guess, yeah, xorg, you know, stuff like that. And so we can we can stop and start services like I can stop the name service cache daemon with this command and restart it. You get the idea, right? And so. If we summarize what we have here, we, we have the kernel. And from there, we have an initial RAM disk. And actually, it turns out we run Guile in the initial RAM disk. So we can use all our friendly Guile libraries within the RAM disk. And from there, we have PID1, which is uh, DMD. And again, that's Guile. So again, we can reuse our friendly libraries, scheme libraries within that, that daemon, right? And then we have Juzalam, so with everything you want. So the cool thing is, yeah, we, we're able to, to reuse a bunch of code here. And if you look at things like, there are some things like device mapping. Uh, you want to be able to do them both in the, en in the init RD or at system initialization time from PID1. And so it's very useful to be able to reuse uh, this kind of code. And building an init RD is something very simple. We can do, yeah, expression to init RD. And let's say I want to, oh, yeah, I want to display something. And then, uh, I don't know. <coughs> then let's say I want to start Emacs from the init RD itself, I can say something like that, right? And you know, I can just build that init RD and it will automatically create an init RD with Emacs and all its dependency within the init RD. And the init RD will display hello and then start Emacs. Wonderful. Uh, we're running out of time, I guess, so I, I won't try it now. Okay, so what's the status of the project? So just to summarize, it's a pretty young project. 
Um, so it's studied of Nix. I've, I've been working on Nixos for four years before, and I started working on Gix uh, two years ago, roughly. And so it, it entered the Gnu project in 2012, and then we, we had a number of milestones. So the first time we had an actual installable operating system was recently this summer. And then we, we, you know, we keep adding more features. And so the last release was actually two days ago. And yeah, another fabulous hacker has ported Gix to ARMv7. So we now have an ARMv7 port and lots of bug fixes and stuff. And one day ago, Gix was officially recognized by the FSF as FSDG compliant, so it's compliant with the free software definition guidelines, which is, which is cool. Our status, so this is this is great and everything, but yeah, this is dog food, right? <laughs> so you know what I mean. So what's the status? So we have a full featured package manager, package manager. We have a thousand packages roughly, which is I think twenty times less than Debian. Okay. It supports four platforms, so basically Intel and um, Mix and ARM. And we have that Gix system distribution, which is a standalone operating system distro. And this is the part which is kind of still dog foody right now. Uh, we, it's, it's really improved with the last release, I think, I hope so. Uh, well, I'm using it daily and it, it works quite well for, for what I'm doing. But we don't have things like, we don't have GNOME KDE, so if that's your thing, you might be disappointed. And we like a few things like Network Manager or Rookid or something like that, which makes it you know, not so convenient sometimes. Uh, we serve binaries, we have a lot of tooling because since we can easily manipulate you know, packages, we have a lot of tools to, for instance, automatically update recipes or to lint recipes so we just to say to flag problems in recipes. And we have internationalization of all the software and the package description. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite active, there are commits, there are quite a bunch of people. So it's saying 36 contributors last year, which is, which is cool, but yeah, it's a lot less than Debian, of course. We're working on it. Uh, yeah, so thanks, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to Gix because um, they are brave people and, and really awesome hackers. So thanks to them and thanks to my employer also for allowing me to travel uh, to Brussels. Uh, work in progress, so we have people working on, on those big packages, big scary packages. So actually we got ISP very recently and people are working on LibreOffice, KDE, and stuff like that. It's a bit scary to me, but I'm glad that people are actually working on it. We have someone who started a GNU Hurt pod because, you know, the GNU system is supposed to be the Hurt. It's work in progress. There's still a lot to be done. Uh, we have someone, uh, so David Thompson developed GeeksWeb, which is this uh, web interface which I showed you. And another thing is Geeks Publish which will allow normal users to publish their binaries over HTTP, so we can build some sort of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. Uh, the road to 1.0, well, we need more OS features, we need more services, as I said. Uh, yeah, we have a, a gig system reconfigure command, which allows you to modify your system configuration, but it's a bit static currently would like it to be more dynamic, like being able to restart a number of services and everything. Uh, yeah, lots of things to do. We need we need a better build farm. We have, you know, problems sometimes because it's a small build farm. Yeah, less dog food, more packages, and uh, yeah, if you have ideas, we'd like to hear from them. So you can help by installing the distro, reporting bugs, sharing ideas. And there's a friendly community on, on IRC if you go to hash geeks on three nodes. So I invite you to, to join us. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if we have time for questions. Is time? Uh, yeah, 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds for a question, maybe one question. 
So what are the differences with Nix? So basically we, we're reusing, I mean Nix and Geeks are both functional package managers. So you, you get the same kind of features from a user viewpoint. And we're actually reusing the low level stuff of Nix, which is the Nix daemon, the thing which set up you know, containers. Uh, but then the rest is completely, it's a separate code base. And so we have this scheme stuff, which, which is I think more hackable than what's available in Nix. So in Nix you have a specific language to describe packages, and then you have another language in which the rest is implemented. You have C++, you have Perl and stuff. So it's a different approach. And also we're using in the system, we're using DMD, um, you know, it's a different, they're using system diff and so on, so it's a different approach, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, so you're um, you're arguing that environment modules are more convenient on clusters, right? Environment modules are more convenient for clusters, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, my my experience at Inria suggests that it's still quite limited, but yeah. Sure. 